very special guest um, that I'm going to sit down and have a conversation with. Um, and we're going to talk about an issue that comes up, in fact, just came up in a panel we've just had on being a digital parent, um, but comes up a great deal in the press, comes up a lot in counselor's office and so on. And it's the vexed question of screen time. How much screen time is right or wrong for my child um, and in fact, my toddler, maybe even my baby, um, as the technology is getting younger and younger. So let me, let me introduce um, our guest. Uh, he is the chair of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Communications and Media. He's a member of the AAP Children, Adolescents, and Media Leadership Working Group. He's also a scientific advisory board member of the Institute of Digital Media and Child Development, as well as a board member of the North Carolina Pediatric Society. He is an adjunct professor of pediatrics at UNC School of Medicine. Stop me if any of this is wrong. And he served as the 2014 media visiting professor at Duke University. He is an author, appears regularly on TV and radio, and in his spare time is a stand-up comedian, correct? That's correct. Well, you can sit down for this. Yeah, but um, Oh, and he is a father of a blended family of five kids. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Hill. So, um, and, and by the way, we really, really want to make sure to get to some questions. Uh, so, you know, think, think about uh, every question you ever wanted to ask an expert pediatrician. He's right here. Um, let's just go, let's just remind ourselves that um, a while ago, like the last century, uh, the AAP came out with some guidance on screen time. What was it? So we have several different policy statements on screen time, but the two that are the most commonly referenced, the two that sort of stick in the popular mind, are that we discourage. And I think that word is very important because people say, you know, they ban screen time. No, we discourage screen time for children under age two. And we have also recommended that families choose a limit of around two hours a day of recreational screen time. And that piece is very important as well because we were talking earlier about educational screen time and right. about you know family use of a screen. Now we're talking about entertainment screen time, you know, watching TV, playing games, whatever, of around two hours a day. Uh, and those are the two pieces that are the most commonly cited. These are the pieces that every article that you read on this will start by saying, the American Academy of Pediatrics says, right. and then you get those two numbers. So, And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't. Yes. Now, you flew up from North Carolina this morning, correct? Yeah. And in your airline magazine, there was right. a cute yeah. cartoon, which I think we can put up on the screen. If, if, do we get, there we go. Look at that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was when they asked us to turn off all of our digital devices. I opened my magazine and I thought, oh, this is good. I don't have a graphic. Uh, so let's bring this. But I love this cartoon because this is where we are. And this is the question that people keep asking us and, and me as a representative of us is, well, is this screen time? Is that screen time? Is this too much? Is that? Well, the screens are everywhere, right? They're ubiquitous. We just got a new study, I think two weeks ago, looking at the ubiquities done in uh, Philadelphia, I think out of, uh, out of University of Pennsylvania, uh, just looking at about 346 families who went through their community clinic asking them about how young they had introduced screens. And the answer was that they were ubiquitous. Well, we knew that. So now as we look at these guidelines as the academy, we are very aware that the term screen time has been outgrown. We know that the screens have outgrown these guidelines. Mm -hmm. So we're now in the process of trying to figure out what do we say next. All right, so you know, I'm a process kind of a guy. I'm really interested in how an organization your size, and how many pediatricians are members? We uh, represent about 64,000 pediatricians in the US and Canada, and then we have uh, relationships with other pediatric societies around the world. So how do you 
go about getting agreement, consensus, what do you call it, amongst that number of people who are probably pretty strong-minded about where you go next with this. They are. So the Academy has this internal structure, which I'm still learning, even though I'm now deep into it. Uh, we have councils, we have committees, we have sections, and then we have a governing board. And as the Council on Communications and Media, that's like what we're in charge of. They're like, okay, everybody who's interested in this topic, get together, go to that room and talk. Uh, and that's what we do. And each council section and committee is responsible for creating guidelines around the topic in which it plans to be expert or hopes to be expert. We don't, however, do that in a vacuum. We do that with the review of any other council committee or section that has an interest. So, for example, let's take the two-hour screen time recommendation. Well, where did that come from? That first appeared in our guidelines from 1999. And it appeared as a result of an incredibly strong study out of New Zealand that was a 35-year study tracking TV watching hours in childhood versus lifetime obesity risk over the 35 years of the study. And the mark was about two hours. People who watched TV for more than two hours as kids ended up having a significantly increased risk of obesity for the rest of their lives. And so you ask, well, is this still relevant? Well, it's relevant based on a recent study from a couple of years ago by Michael Rich's group at Harvard where they updated it and they gave kids little monitors and pinged them at random intervals during the day and said, of the screens in your environment right now, of which there were three or four, mm. which one are you paying the most attention to? Huh. And then they had them video their environment so that they could see the screens and then they laboriously went through these visit videos and found that the, those who were watching passive television at that time on whatever screen, but they were watching a show, just sit back, kick back, watching, still had an increased risk of obesity. So, for example, will that live in the new guidelines? Well, the Obesity Council really cares very much. It's now the Institute for Healthy Childhood Weight. So they get to look at this and they get to say, you know what, here are the data, here are the people you know, that we're listening to and we have a strong feeling about this. So there will be review uh, for the Council on Violence and Injury Prevention, for example, will have their say. Uh, everybody who feels like they have a stake in what we're saying gets a chance to pass judgment on it. And we also have a committee called COQIPS. And COQIPS' job is to look at what everybody else does and make sure that it meets the most stringent and rigorous data guidelines possible. Hmm. So especially if we actually put out a guidelines. A guidelines is where you're telling doctors what to do. And the reason that that matters is insurance companies and lawyers then go back and say, well, your organization put out these guidelines. Mm. You didn't follow them and something bad happened, mm. right? So these people are in charge of making sure that when we put out a document like that, it has undergone the most thorough, rigorous, possible scientific review, and we have requested that COQIPS help us out in this revision because we know that all sorts of parties will come back and say, well, you didn't look at this study, or you right. didn't weigh this enough, or, and we wanna make sure that when they come back and look at these documents, that we have got the most rigorous possible data, and when we don't, that we have called it out very clearly and graded our evidence based on, you know, is this a, a reproducible, you know, result that we've seen a bunch of times in a bunch of people, or is this a bunch of experts sitting in a room thinking, yeah, it seems like a good idea. Right, right. right. I, I, I'm encouraged that I think you're making a distinction for the, maybe for the first time, between screen time and screen use. Talk about that distinction. Right, so this is something that we have been very acutely aware of. That's the point of this cartoon. Right, is right. the screen time. Uh, I had the, the chance to uh, host a debate between two of my good friends and colleagues on the council, Dimitri Christakis and Don Schiffer, in last year's uh, American Academy of Pediatrics meeting in San Diego. We just left DC a few weeks ago yes. for this year, so this is 2014. And uh, they did like a point-counterpoint a point debate. And if you take the extreme side, well, you say, okay, a kid texting with his deployed parent in Afghanistan, that's screen time, we shouldn't do that. Well, you really have to take an extreme position to come out against, uh, you know, Skyping with your deployed parent, 
Nobody is going to come out against that. It's ridiculous, right? Is that screen time? Well, it's on a screen. It's time. But no, of course not. Nobody's going to count that. So we're going to have to put that in a box and say there are obviously some uses of screens that are very pro-social, very mm -hmm. positive. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we're going to have to be clear about what hasn't changed. There are tens of thousands of apps out there that suggest they're going to educate your child in some way. Some of them may. Others, nobody has shown anybody data suggesting that that's actually true. So, you know, we had this come up with, uh, you know, with Baby Einstein. And again, Dimitri Christakis there was, was fairly instrumental uh, in reviewing that and in saying, we, you've made this educational promise, but you haven't backed it up. And I think we're going to have to be clear that there are all sorts of developers and people promoting educational uses who have not released, you know, good peer-reviewed data to show that this app is going to do what it says it does. And you've got a lot of parents investing very deeply in some of these products. And I think, you know, there will probably be a place, too, to say caveat emptor. What we know mm. about kids sitting in front of screens is uh, the, the data from television is at least under age two, it reduces language development substantially. Mm. Uh, will interactive and mobile screens change that? Maybe. We can certainly hope. Uh, but as Dimitri told the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, kids need laps more than apps. And we heard that echoed uh, earlier today as well and at our, at our breakout session. The primary mode of learning for young children remains looking at somebody else's face and being in somebody else's presence. Are there apps that encourage that? Yes, absolutely. I think that's going to be really neat to see. Mm -hmm. But can you use the screen in lieu of an interpersonal interaction? Yes. Do we know if, you know, swiping and tapping is the same level of decreased language development as watching a soap opera? No, we don't. Uh, but I think that we're going to have space to extrapolate from the data that we do have and say, you know, this is something that we still need to be aware of. Uh, speaking of data, our own research showed, uh, which we released yesterday, that 55% right. of parents of older teens have no time limits whatsoever. Uh, exactly. And so we're seeing some uh, pretty heavy usage. So let's finish with the process stuff. So you're going to crunch the numbers, you're right. going to consult, you're going to do all this stuff. When is this going to be released? Well, that is a good question. Our target is to get this out at the November 2016, or October 2016, meeting of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Cool. That is our target. This will require the Academy to do something that it does periodically, which is to fast track a policy statement. Mm. The process normally for producing a policy statement is a two to three year long process, because you've got a, a huge literature review to do. Mm. You got to actually write it, and then you got to pass it around to every other interested party in the Academy, to give you their edits, their suggestions, that you take the notes back, you rewrite it, you pass it around a second time, everybody says, okay, that works, and then you pass it to the board, the board reads it and they say, eh, make one more change and we put it out. We're gonna ask the board to do that in a 12 month period, and we are waiting right now for their answer, but in the meantime, we have the authors selected, and they're starting to work on three documents. One, where we had had media under age two, uh, Jenny Rudesky, who has done tremendous work on young children and media, will be heading up a statement that should probably end up being media under age five. Uh, feeling like the literature that we have on young children seems to have sort of a break point there. And then we've got literature on what happens when you get into school. Mm. Uh, so Megan Moreno, who is an adolescent medicine specialist and has written tremendous articles on the effects of social media in adolescence, will be heading up the report for school age and above children. Then the third piece of this that binds it all together will be the technical report. So the documents, the policy statements are pretty short. Here's kind of why we think something. Here's our advice to parents. Here's our advice to pediatricians. However, people are going to say, well, where'd you get that from? Then we've got this technical report. That's going to be the big tome that collects the data. And when somebody wants to nitpick it and say, OK, really, where'd you get that from? OK, well, here's reference number 139. And it came out of 139 to 142. So that is uh, being headed up by Linda Reed Chiasakos. 
uh, who is just a tremendously hard worker and, and smart person. Uh, but she's going to have a lot of help with that as well. So we have some, some top researchers in the hall. And, uh, yes. If they need to get a hold of you, David, how would you Absolutely. Come, come reach me through the academy. Uh, several people here have already found me through Twitter. I'm at Dav Hill, D-A-V-H-I-L-L. -L. I've actually got, I got one for the book, but that's like, for this, for this crowd, it's at Dav Hill. That's my at name. Dav Hill, you've heard it here, folks. So, um, so come find I, My guess is it's going to have a huge impact when, when the, the guidance comes out. We hope so. We hope so. I, one of the conversations that we had here, and one of the conversations that's come out of our endeavor from May, in May we began this process by collecting a, uh, a broad group of researchers, policymakers, industry representatives as well, pediatricians in Chicago, mm -hmm. for a meeting that we call the uh, Growing Up Digital Research Symposium, trying to get a handle on what we know, what we don't know, what we need to know from a broad group of stakeholders, people from Sesame Workshop, people from, uh, we actually had a representative from uh, it Google, um, we had Electronic Arts, sent somebody, and then we had a ton of psychologists, pediatricians, psychiatrists who spoke as well. Uh, and our question to them was, where do we need to go with this? And then we wrote up the answers that we felt they gave us and published that in September, and I was one of the three authors on that, which is why you reached out to me, mm -hmm. uh, which was really a commentary and sort of the notes from the meeting of the Federal Reserve Board. Yeah. Right? It wasn't, it wasn't the policy, but it was, what are we thinking? Right. And uh, that created a lot of reaction, uh, which was all over the map. Yes. Some of it took it way too far and said, great, the AAP has overturned all of their guidelines. They now love the media for kids. That wasn't true. It wasn't a guideline. We didn't overturn that much. Mm. On the other hand, we also came under tremendous criticism. Oh my gosh, you're abandoning all of your principles. You're leaving behind all of this tremendous research. You're, you're, you're getting in bed with industry and just caving to the demands of parents who feel guilty. And that wasn't true either. You know, we are looking for the research, and the wonderful thing about this is we come in with only one idea, which is we need to do our best to let science guide us to the best possible outcomes for children's health and social and intellectual development. So that's the only place we're trying to go. I noticed the Dow Jones lost 200 points <laughs> there too, and I, I put it down to what happened. I think um, let's let's. Let's jump a little bit. Let's talk anecdotal stuff now. You bet. I mean, stats are great and research is great. What are you seeing? What are you seeing in your, in your practice? What are you seeing in your home? Talk about that. Right. Well, I have to live this, right? I got, I've got five kids ranging in age from 10 to uh, 17 right now. Uh, we use our media a lot. We try to use it in healthy ways, but I have seen the most positive effects and the most negative effects of media. On the positive effect, as a cautious parent, I know where my kids are because I use Find My Friends. And that's part of their contract, part of their cell phone contract is I want your Find My Friends on at all times because sometimes that's how I go pick them up. Uh, I just follow the dot until I get there. Uh, for positive effects, we uh, have downloaded uh, Jackbox TV games. And uh, we, with seven people in the house, getting everybody around a board game can get a little bit crowded. But if we put it up on the big screen, uh, we can play really fun games together as a family. We're all sitting on the couch, we're all talking to each other, we're ribbing each other, we're laughing, we're making jokes. It's also a chance to, to practice being decent people because if the kids start harshing on each other too much hmm. during this game, you'd be like, hang on, that's, that's out of bounds. Don't make fun of your little brother, he's 10, he's gonna misspell stuff. Right? Mm. So we use those things to bring us together. When we're talking about references, oh, this is a great 80s song. You guys haven't heard it. Hang on, grab my phone and find it while I drive. You have to hear this, right? So we can use those, uh, those technologies to bring us together as a family, to find common points of reference, certainly to communicate with each other throughout the day. We use it heavily. On the other hand, yeah. my daughter is hanging out in my office right now because she was on Snapchat, uh, which I heard a new epithet for today. Thank you. Um, and <laughs> I'm not going to repeat it up here. Um, and she and another girl in her class were getting into a threat war. They didn't like each other. Huh. And they started to threaten to hurt each other. Whoa. And the other girl 
thought to screenshot the threats coming from my daughter. Wow. And my daughter did not screenshot the other side of the conversation. So mm. one of them is suspended for five days. Wow. That, I would argue, is a, something that would be very difficult to have happened without this technology. Now, she's been on and off Snapchat. I don't, I, I don't love it because it's very hard for me to know what's going on if I need to. And we said at various difficult times, okay, you know, not loving the Snapchat, please pull it off. And uh, then we gave it back. Hmm. And this was definitely a demonstration that her frontal lobe has not caught up with the technology right. available to her, right? right. So she's, she goes back into class tomorrow. Uh, but, you know, we, we have seen both sides of, of what this can do and what this can be. Sure. Let me just test to see if there's a question in the audience. Um, yes, we have one over here. Do we have a... Oh, oh, did you put your hand up or... Oh, good, good. You, just wait for the microphone. If, oh, I'm just kidding. No, you have Bring a photographs later. You can, you can send them to my Twitter account. I, he doesn't have a rash. Um, I have a question just about um, the policy, or I, I'm a media literacy educator, and so I spend a lot of time talking with educators and parents about how we're talking about media with our kids. So I'm just, there was a recent tip sheet that you guys put out that I thought was really quite good. I'm just wondering about the conversations that are happening or not happening in the exam room. Right. So on the wellness visits, I know that I love my pediatrician, but I've never been asked anything about media use in my home. And I do think that as far as a health and wellness conversation with students and especially with parents that conversation needs to happen and I think have having it happen in the same conversation that we're talking about nutrition and health is just would be so great yes. so I'm just wondering about your thoughts on that and what might be in the the works thank you for asking that there's a process the process is the Bright Futures Guidelines, which under the Affordable Care Act was adopted as the official guidelines for wellness exams for children. So if you have an ACA-compatible insurance plan, then the doctors are supposed to be referring to the AAP Bright Futures Guidelines as the guide of what they're gonna talk about at these wellness exams. And as you might imagine, they talk about safety, nutrition, exercise, family relationships, and media is included in those guidelines. Now, it's been a while since we've asked pediatricians how many of them were getting to that question. And part of my job is to proselytize to my peers. I go around talking, and one of my, one of my speeches is why you should ask about media. The answer that I give is it is, the, it is the string that pulls the entire ball of yarn. Because if you ask about media, you learn how discipline is being run, you learn how much time is being set aside for exercise, you learn about how intellectual stimulation is happening within the house. You learn a ton about the family dynamics from this one question. It is worked into the Bright Futures guidelines, and in fact, Megan Moreno headed up an effort. There's going to be, we're on Bright Futures 3 right now. There's going to be a Bright Futures 4 fairly soon, and our council was tasked with updating the questions. We had had the same two questions in every age group before, which was, you know, are, are there screens under age two and uh, are you using greater than two hours of screen time a day? Uh, what we did was to alter the questions based on age group and try to make them more appropriate for each age-based visit. Now, as somebody who practices a lot, I see about 25 patients a day on average in my day job, um, I know that the, the 15 minutes that I'm allotted for these visits doesn't allow me to get to everything that I'm supposed to talk about. And people pick and choose. Sometimes I pick and choose based on what I think might be going on in the family. I figure everybody's got a bike helmet, but you know maybe there aren't limits around media. Uh, maybe I think poisons are put away, but they're not, uh, you know, a gate around the pool. Yeah, I've got, I've got a lot of stuff to hit. And different providers figure out what's important. But we are very much on a mission to make sure that all 64,000 of our colleagues understand the importance. One thing that we're going to be doing is presenting the PEDS 21 conference at the AAP meeting next year, which means, like, it's just a bunch of numbers and letters. But within the AAP, it's a big deal. We pick one topic every year that's especially important to the academy, and we do a half-day conference before our big annual meeting uh, where a lot of people come and listen to experts talk about that topic for an entire afternoon. 
And we get to do that on media next year. And that's one of the ways that we sort of push out the exam room conversation. So if we do a good job, hopefully, if not your kid's doctor, at least a quorum of pediatricians out there will be bringing this up at their wellness exams. David, let me just challenge you on something. Because um, in my comments yesterday, I mentioned the world of connected and artificially intelligent toys. And I mentioned Hello Barbie, and funny enough, I actually brought her with me today. This may be, I don't know if they're, they're yeah, they're picking this up. This may be her premiere. I don't know if she's ever appeared on a stage before, and she's just getting herself revved up. I don't know if you can see the, the lights are flashing. She will ask me a question in a minute. So this isn't a screen, and this could be used by a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, whatever, for hours. Yes. And um, she, we, we've already had some pretty deep and meaningful conversations. Uh, I, actually, I said I wanted to be a doctor when I grew up, and she remembered that. She's remembered uh, the names of various uh, siblings that I have, and she knows what time of day it is, and all kinds of things. Do you think this is a good thing? And also, do you think this is incorporated in the screen time debate? You can hold her if you like. Oh, thank you, yeah, thank sure. you. Can we, can we talk? You, um, she can't find the Wi-Fi at the moment. I so so we, can't, we can't really have a conversation? Not yet, no, but maybe later. I was later. dying to ask her what she thinks of Shelley Turkle. I, was, I know what Shelley, Sherry Turkle thinks Sherry, of her. Right. <laughs> I, just, I just didn't know if it was mutual or not. Uh, <laughs> I, I met Sherry a few months ago at that same conference that Amanda was talking about, and she, she brought this up. I have to say, I think we've entered the uncanny valley of the dolls. Uh, Thank you, AI peeps, thank you. Uh, so, you know, it's a good question. I, oh, she's, Let's talk later. No, okay, we'll talk later. She would like, she doesn't want to talk now. Oh, okay. This is the reaction that most, you know, uh, right. attractive women have to me. All right, so, I'll, I'll, I'll put her um, back to sleep. I'll put her back to sleep. Can we talk later? I get a lot of that. Um, no, you know, I think it's a great question. I, I, I have to agree it's spooky. Uh, as a scientist, there's no data on this yet, right? So I can't make an official comment until somebody studies this. But I think it's going to be a fascinating study. Uh, the question that I had when I learned about her was if she's monitoring and listening and going to a central computer somewhere that is presumably being monitored and programmed and has algorithms running, what happens when she witnesses child abuse? What happens when she witnesses domestic violence? What happens when some child tells this one creature that will listen to them at all times and that they imbue with personification because that's how she's been designed very well, that they're not sure about their sexuality or they want to run away? Uh, if I'm at Mattel and I'm running these servers, then I want the liability people to be standing very close to me because Barbie is going to hear things mm -hmm. that, I, and can Barbie say, is there an adult in your life you can talk to about this? I would, as a pediatrician, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Bad so stuff happens. So I, I met with Oren Jacob, who's the head of Toy Talk, who's behind this in San Francisco a couple of months ago. And they have gone over and beyond, you know, making sure that they are uh, COPPA compliant and secure and all the rest of it. But if hackers can hack into the Pentagon, I mean, perhaps they can hack into these servers. And by the way, uh, what is also uncanny is that as a parent, you can get a download of your kids' conversations uh, once a week as well, which may or may not be a good thing. And speaking of blended families, does the stepdad get a uh, chance to hear about these things? I mean, it's... New questions. Speaking of questions, do we have another one in the, in the audience? Yes, one back here. I think we've got time for this one last question. You bet. With regard to the screen time issue, we have worked mightily for more than two decades to get school districts to effectively use technology in teaching and learning, and we're seeing more and more districts adopt one-to-one -one initiatives and provide devices for students, and yet we still have questions about screen time, and some parents raise that with their local school district. So I'm just wondering, when you reference that all screen time is not equal, uh, where that falls down with the recommendations of school districts and how districts are trying to move forward with screen time to keep parents comfortable. Right, so 
there are times when we make educational recommendations because education is, is a critical part of child health, but we also know that we're coming at this from the medical side, not the education side. The answer in the past has been to distinctly call out entertainment screen time as opposed to homework screen time, right? I've got one child who's doing an all online class right now. Uh, my aforementioned daughter is in flipped classes right now, so she has to watch the didactic portion of the class at home mm. on a screen, and then she comes in and does the coursework in the classroom with the assumption that everybody has already seen the lecture Two of her classes are like that right now, videos on flipped classes. Uh, that makes it difficult as a parent because if, as I have wanted to do, and as your uh, survey that you released yesterday mentioned, parents take away screen time as punishment sometimes, or sometimes simply because kids don't seem to be using it well. Uh, if I want to do that, I can't. The best I can do is say, well, you have to use your computer out here where I can watch you and make sure that you're not watching Pretty Little Liars, but you're actually taking notes from the class. It also brings up a digital divide question. Are my kids go to an incredibly diverse school, and I really like that for them, but they've got classmates who don't have food, much less a high-speed high internet connection. Even on her MacBook Air, the notes on the board are sometimes difficult to read in these lectures. If I'm trying to do that on a cell phone, or even worse, I'm borrowing my parents' cell phone to try and do it, and they need it to get calls from work, right? I think it brings up a lot of questions. How much of that will we comment on? I don't know yet, uh, but my guess is uh, that we will probably stop at recommending media education and not venture too far into the world of how technology is integrated into education, because there are people who do that for a living and are really, really smart about it. Uh, who should probably be the ones to comment on it. All right. Well, listen, thank you very much for uh, sharing your screen time with us. Um, we will follow your guidance and your, your process very, very closely. I highly recommend David's written a very good blog um, for our Good Digital Parenting section of the website. Ha go and have a look at that. Uh, Dr. David Hill, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks for having me.